<laughs> Comrades, today we discuss the thought of Karl Marx. Yes. We're going to be backing up a bit before we do that and thinking about some of the history of the 19th century that gets us up to the thought of Marx. But Marx is really our main objective for the day. Why do we study him in a course on ideas of the 20th century? Well, because Marxism becomes one of the main ideas of the 20th century. It spreads to much of the world. The, world, the parts pictured here in red become part of the communist bloc at some point during the 20th century. And so it ends up having a huge impact on world history, not really initially, but largely in the 20th century. So it becomes a key thing to study, and it's important to understand its sources and its nature in order to understand later what happens during the 20th century. Now, there's a little bit of intellectual background. I want to tie things back to what we were discussing last time with our distinction between the manifest image and the scientific image. The manifest image is our common sense picture of the world. It's our picture of the world as consisting of ordinary, middle-sized physical objects. You and me, desks and tables, cameras, uh, screens, iPads, glasses, and so on. That's the sort of ordinary picture we have of the world. But the scientific revolution introduced a new idea. In fact, at one point, John Locke is talking about vision. He says, how is it possible for us to see things? And he actually comes up with a strangely modern theory of vision. He doesn't know what to call anything, but he says, well, there are these particles that light consists of. They're like little tennis balls that bounce off things and bounce into our eyes. And that actually isn't so terribly different from a contemporary idea of what light is. Notice what he's doing. He's taking a common sense type thing like light and describing it in terms of microparticles, in terms of waves, in terms of fields, in terms of, well, as he puts it, little tennis balls, but other things like that that are microscopic, we can't ordinarily see them, nevertheless, their behavior explains the behavior of the things we ordinarily encounter. So, that's the picture of, really, the manifest image, the scientific image, and then the problem sellers points to is how we put those things together. Well, there's a certain way of taking that idea that leads to significant trouble throughout the 20th century. I'm going to refer to it as neo-Gnosticism. It's lonely being one of the few who truly knows. But that becomes a common theme. A great number of intellectuals think they've got it figured out. They understand the base level well enough, not just to do science, but to actually control the world, to be able to shape the world the way they want. And that's what I'm calling this neo-Gnostic vision. Now, why neo-Gnostic? Well, the Gnostics were an ancient group who thought there was a special secret knowledge. And if you had the key to that knowledge, then you could bring about utopia, either here or gain admission to heaven. And so it's that sort of idea. There's some secret knowledge, which is such that if you possess it, you can bring about utopia. Now, to return to last time, the manifest image of the world is a sort of surface image of the world, a common sense image. We think of ourselves as free beings. We're rational beings. We act for reasons in the manifest image. We tend to think of ourselves as acting rightly or wrongly, virtuously or viciously. We take responsibility. We think we are actually agents who act for reasons in the world. But the scientific image gives us a very different picture of ourselves. On that picture, a sort of depth picture of the world, we're determined by something we aren't conscious of, either by scientific laws and the motions of the microparticles or by something else, maybe by random jumps of electrons, whatever it is, there's something that is controlling what we're doing. We're not conscious of that. The reasons we actually give have nothing to do with the ultimate causes our, of our behavior. They're really just rationalizations. Morality is either just nonsense, because after all, there are no oughts in science, there are no goods and bads, and so either it doesn't make any sense at all, or it really reduces to something else. It's an indirect way of saying, oh, well, this produces as much pleasure as possible, or as little pain as possible, or uh, serves the evolutionary needs of the species, or something like that. And finally, on this vision, since we're not free, we have no responsibility. After all, we're not really in control. The electrons are in control. Now, if that's the picture, we have the manifest image, it's in some way acting the way it does because of the objects of the scientific image and what they are doing, then from a purely scientific version, you might say, nothing really follows. It's true that the world isn't as we think it is. We aren't as we think we are. On the other hand, what follows from that? Well, huh, <laughs> you know, not much of anything. Oh, surprise, the world isn't exactly what you thought. Well, big deal. However, that's because nobody really knows. Nobody can manipulate the connections. But suppose people could. At least I should say they can't manipulate them in a very large-scale way. We can manipulate them a little bit. You have a headache, I can say, oh, take this pill. And maybe I can even explain why that pill helps to relieve your pain. And so we can do this in sort of minor ways. We can't do it in very big ways. 
If I want to say, ooh, I want to bring about utopia, what should I do to the electrons? <laughs> that question doesn't really have any answer. But now, what if I had a different theory? What if I thought I knew the basic level and understood it, and moreover, I understood in a big picture kind of way the connections between that basic level and the surface level? Then I might think, aha, to produce the outcome I want on the surface level, to produce this utopia, I know what to do. I can manipulate the base to bring about my goal. Well, if I had that knowledge and were convinced that I understood the connections, then maybe that project would make sense. So I might be able to take what you might say works in very limited ways in medicine and pharmacology and things like that and start applying that to the whole social structure. Well, that sort of, I'll call it intellectual hubris, that idea that you understand things well enough to do that, combined with a two-level theory of this sort that distinguishes something like a manifest and a scientific level, leads to a sort of two-level conception of society. There are those who know and those who don't, right? And so you get what I'm calling modern Gnosticism or neo-Gnosticism. There are those who know the underlying causes. Call them the elite or the intellectuals or the anointed. And then there are those who don't, the common people, who don't understand the ba basic structure, don't understand the connections well enough to do anything about it. Now, this is, and by the way, in this course we're going to be discussing a lot of ideas without meaning to endorse them. We're going to talk about Mussolini. We're going to talk about Hitler. I am not on their side. I'm not having you read them because I think, oh, they're awesome. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and so this is one of those ideas that maybe you can tell. I don't tend to like it very much. On the other hand, it's an important idea. It motivates all sorts of actors, people who gain real political power throughout the 20th century. And so the Gnostic version of this is not merely the distinction between the manifest image and the scientific image, but the thought that it's possible to know this and to know the connections well enough to manipulate the base to produce the outcome you want at the higher level. You can do something that actually transforms the world by applying the appropriate manipulations to whatever the structure is that really has the causal power and serves as the scientific image on that, con on that conception. So here's the basic idea. Societies are now imperfect. People cause harm, right? They do all sorts of damage to other people. There are all sorts of things wrong with the world. Disease, war, conflict, sisters-in-law, all sorts of terrible <laughs> things, okay? But look, people really aren't behaving freely. They're driven by forces that are hidden from them. And so maybe if we could change the pattern of those forces, we could get people to behave differently. And so if we can change how people act, well, we can change social institutions. That maybe could change the pattern of forces. Maybe that could change the way people behave. So maybe if we manipulate, well, something, right? It depends what exactly we think is going on on that base scientific level. But whatever it is, if we are able to change institutions and change what's happening at that level, then maybe we can transform the way people behave. We just have to know how. So that's the vision. That's this utopian ideal, you might say, that if we only understand the connections well enough and understand the base level, we can bring about utopia. And so this leads us to think, look, most of the time what people say, it's not really what they mean. It's not really what's going on. There's this base level that's determining everything. So the fancy highfalutin name for this is the hermeneutics of suspicion. Hermeneutics, the science of interpretation. The idea is you interpret what people say in a fashion that isn't really on the surface, you interpret it in terms of the basic level. This sort of thing goes on most commonly uh, and most famously in Freudian psychology. So, why are you here to see me? Well, I'm unhappy. What are you unhappy about? I hate my boss and he hates me. Ah, oh, tell me about your boss. And then you start talking and says, oh, tell me about your father. Hmm. Sounds like your boss and your father are a lot alike. They're both older men. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so maybe you really hate your father, and you think your father hates you. Well, no, no, I get along okay with you. You know, et cetera, that bit, sort of thing. Yeah, and then you say, no, look, Alice, you don't know what's going on. You're completely wrong. And say, ah, oh, resistance. <laughs> resistance is futile. <laughs> resistance is common in psycho. Actually, this is what Freud says. When Freud finds patients who say, that's a bunch of garbage, he says, ah, oh, Okay, you're resisting treatment. This is common. This is part of my theory, and so on. And so he doesn't take it seriously. He just says, yes, my theory predicts you would say that. I have to interpret you what you say in terms of these underlying causes. Okay, so anyway. Um, yeah, I'm going to jump to this. 
Suppose you think there is a group of people, the elite, the intellectuals, the anointed, who actually know something about the base level. Then a certain problem arises. What are you supposed to do? After all, the thought is, well, you could bring about utopia if only you change things at the basic level in the right way. But what would utopia be like? What would an ideal world be like? Pause for a moment and think about that. Imagine your ideal world. What would it be like? Are you supposed to answer? Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, I could just show you the films <laughs> if I didn't expect you to actually talk to me. No tuition. No tuition. <laughs> ah, okay. So there's one aspect of your utopia. What other aspects? Education would be completely different. Education would be completely different? Yes. I'm hurt. <laughs> <laughs> like, technically, I don't know if you've seen the video of I, why I like education but hate um, like school or something like that. Ah, it's yes. Like, okay. you cram everything the night before just to forget it at all two weeks later. Yeah, right. No, listen, I didn't like school much either. I mean, by the time I got to your level, I started liking it. But I think I was shaped by the fact that when I was in second grade, we were doing this thing of learning to count by tens, and the teacher was taking out these packs of ten pen pencils, and we were all saying, 10, 20, 30, you know? Oh, God, this is so boring. <laughs> so I wasn't really paying attention, and when she brought up an empty hand, I was the only person in the class who shouted out 70. So she locked me in a broom closet for an hour. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, after that, I didn't like school very much. Um, but I like it when I'm on this side of it. This is much better. <laughs> Uh, in any case, okay, so the education would be different. Tell me more about your utopia. Yeah. Uh, no diseases, um, everyone's healthy. No diseases, everyone's healthy. Okay, that sounds like a good aspect of utopia. Tell me more. Yeah. Uh, no, like, gap between the rich and the poor. No gap between the rich and the poor. What else? Yeah. But if you don't have a gap between the rich and the poor, then everyone will be the same. It'll be very, like, we'll all be poor. Sorry, rich. Ooh, well, this is something we're going to encounter when we think about Marx. Yeah, suppose there really were no gap between the rich and the poor. Then it's like, Ooh, if you work really hard, guess what? You get nothing for it. <laughs> now, maybe you'd work hard anyway, because you just love work. But guess what? There are a lot of people who don't love work. <laughs> so that does generate a problem. Uh, other aspects of your utopia. Yeah. You can eat whatever you want and not get fat. Yes. Yes, I was, I was so excited when they came up with a kind of fat that was like the mirror image of ordinary fats. So you could eat like potato chips and tortilla chips and so on with this stuff. And it would just flow through you like plastic. It would not actually make you fat. I thought, oh, utopia has arrived. <laughs> but guess what? It flowed through you like plastic. It gave everyone diarrhea. So. <laughs> So much for the greatest nutrition innovation of 1985. Um, Thank you. <laughs> in any event, yeah, you, we could describe this in lots of ways, but notice we could have different visions. And so there's a sort of problem. Aha, uh -huh. well, maybe we have the key to the universe and we create our utopia, but what would that be like? What should we actually do? Well, in a way, it's easy to answer, right? Change the base to change the surface into your utopia. But hold on a second. Which kind of utopia do we want? What should we strive for? And what should we strive for first? And so on. We have to know what we ought to do. But now we've got a problem. The Gnostic vision here relies on norms, oughts. What are we, the anointed, to do with our newfound power since we've figured out all these structures? What kind of state of society should we try to bring about? And yet, it also undermines them because the oughts are all up there at the surface level. They're not there at the base level. We actually think they're all nonsense, right? Or they're cover for something else. And hold on a second, we need them to decide what to do. So I'm going to refer to that as the paradox of the anointed. And it's something that will come about, or come back to haunt us at a number of points in the course. This vision relies on norms. We have to know what we ought to do, what an ideal state of society would be, what really would be the best state of society, what would be better than the present, what would be just, and so on. That means we need norms to decide what to do. But the vision also undermines those very norms. They are treated purely as derivative or as nonsense on the level that matters, the basic level. They don't exist at all. And so we're forced to rely for our very decisions to shape our utopia on these things that we've undermined and we've thought are nonsense. And so what do we do? It becomes a serious problem. And we'll see it rear its head again and again as people have this vision and then find, as they try to put it into practice, they run into very serious trouble. 
Well, let's back up and take a look at the historical background to see how we actually get to Marx's thought. The basic thing we're going to be talking about today, though, we'll discuss various aspects of his thought. The most important one will be the Communist Manifesto, published in 1848, which is a key year of revolutions in Europe, one of them pictured there in Germany. So let's take a look at how all of this comes about. We talked last time about the scientific revolution of the Enlightenment and the way in which it transformed our understanding of nature, our ability to look around and see nature as governed by scientific laws that were universal, that were necessary, that were absolute. That immediately didn't have much impact on the way people lived. However, the technology that the scientific revolution made possible did begin about 100 years later, maybe, to start have a, having a significant impact on the way the average person lived. Suppose that you were alive in 1750. You would probably be living pretty much as your parents had lived and as your grandparents had lived, as people had lived 100 or 1,000 or even 5,000 years before. What could you really accomplish? Well, really, what your own muscle power would enable you to accomplish, maybe with the help of a few animals, a few primitive tools, but you really wouldn't be able to accomplish a great deal, nothing very different from what anybody else had been able to achieve since roughly the Iron Age. Suddenly, technology comes on the scene that transforms agriculture in the 18th century, and then in the 19th century transforms manufacturing, makes it possible to actually have industry, to have factories, to produce the kinds of things that no one had ever been able to produce before. That changed the nature of human society very fundamentally. Let's start with the agricultural revolution. After, seven to, to ever, after 1750 in Britain, and spreading then throughout the rest of the world, the agricultural revolution made it possible for farmers to grow much more food with much less work. There was more food, lower prices. It took a lot less labor. That meant that people had more money for other things. Also, there was a lot of surplus labor, people who were no longer needed on the farms. And that led to a transformation of society and made possible, actually, the industrial revolution to follow. Now, how did this come about? Well, partly, people were able to develop new farm tools. Partly, they developed a four-field crop rotation system that was much more efficient than earlier systems. Partly, they imported crops from the New World that enabled the soil to be enriched, as well as new ways of producing food. Also, they developed uh, better fertilizers, uh, both synthetic and natural fertilizers. They understood, in short, the science of farming much better. And so the result of that was, well, new technologies. Here you see... 19th century farmers spraying fields. Here you see the kinds of large farms that became possible with this sort of technology that were completely impossible before. What you could really farm was limited by what you could do with your own hands, with a few horses, with some oxen. But now suddenly you could do large estates. Uh, corn from the New World. You could grow food much more efficiently, and you could also allow fields to lie fallow and replenish them. And so the result of that was much more food available to the population. And it really solved two kinds of problems, both the problem of food shortages, where there were local failures of harvest and things like that, sort of local famines, but also when harvests were good, what were the farmers going to do with all that extra food? Well, as we'll see, they soon developed ways of transporting that food to markets to make it possible for us to solve the problem of surpluses as well as the problem of food shortages. And so the idea of being able to go to a market and buy food in this sort of way became something that was much easier and much more available for people than it had ever been before. Now, this was possible only because large and successful farms actually were left alone. There was enough stability in government to grant people rights to property, and that made it possible for people to develop farms and keep them. Before that, at a certain stage, if you were too successful, some noble, maybe even the king, would come in and kick you off the land and take it over. And so it required the kind of stability of the political revolution of the Enlightenment here, John Locke, who helps to bring that about, and also the power, for example, of parliament uh, against the king. In any case, that political background obtained in much of the world by the 18th century, and so it made possible a transformation. The result of that was a transformation in what the population was able to do. In 1800, four people out of five worked on farms. Only one person lived in a village or a town or a city. And so 80% popula 80 of the population was involved in food production. 
A hundred years later, it was down to 20% of the people involved in food production, and 80% were now in cities, in towns, doing other things. That means that throughout the 19th century, 60% of the population moved from the countryside into the cities and had to find something different to do. By the way, what percentage of people now are involved in food production? 2%. 2%, yes. So it's an amazing transformation. Now 98% of the people are out here. I thought there should be a third slide where I had 98 little pictures of them. But I thought, that, eh, no. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, during the 19th century, there was a huge movement of population. 60% of the people ended up moving from the countryside to the cities. There were other things in technology that transformed the way people lived and amplified these effects. Consider clothing. Edmund Cartwright, in 1787, invented the power loom. Before that, clothing tended to be handmade. All of a sudden, it became possible to produce fabric, and then shortly thereafter that clothing, in factories. And so the growth of this was very rapid. 1813, there were 2,400 of these power looms in Great Britain. By mid-century, there were a quarter of a million. And so the idea of making clothing by hand almost disappeared by the middle of the 19th century. That meant that clothing became much cheaper, much more widely available. Instead of the average person having one or two suits of clothing, you have this, and when it gets dirty, you change into that, that's pretty much it. No, suddenly people began to actually, <laughs> well, have wardrobes, began to actually look better, began to smell better, because you could actually like wash clothes <laughs> and have something else to put on. Um, for the first time, people were able to wear cheap cotton underwear. It drastically reduced the incidence of disease. So, here's an example of a power loom. This meant, of course, that the average person involved in the clothing industry was no longer sitting there doing a bit of sewing all by themselves. They were operating something like that. And that transformed the nature of labor significantly. Here's another example of a power loom. Well, that was only the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. A major development was James Watt's invention of the steam engine. In the 1760s, he invented the engine. At first, it couldn't really do much, and it was very large. But in 1782, with the rotary steam engine, he made it much more powerful. By 1800, it was capable of generating 10,000 horsepower. Think about that, the power you can have by harnessing 10,000 horses together. So it was something much greater than anybody had able, been able to harness before. By the middle of the century, it was 1.3 million horsepower. And so the increase in power, the increase in what human beings could accomplish was vast. And again, led to a fundamental transformation in the way the average person lived their lives. Here's a painting of Watt doing his calculations and looking into the fire and getting the idea of the steam engine. And here is one of his first rotary steam engines. It was big. <laughs> it wasn't terribly useful in that form, but it didn't take long for people to find uses in building roads, in building canals, in building steamships. And so steamships became commonplace throughout the 19th century. They got places much more predictably, much more safely than sailing ships did. <clears throat> Railroads became a primary means of transportation. In 1804, the first locomotive appeared on the scene. That is Watt's first design for a locomotive. It went five miles an hour. In 1830, there is the first passenger railway. It could go 16 miles an hour and hold quite a few people, as you can see. Now, by the way, by, to us, 16 miles an hour sounds pretty crappy, right? But imagine that the way you get everywhere is by walking or maybe taking horseback. Well, this was faster than horses over the long haul. It was certainly much faster than walking. By mid-century, Trains could go 50 miles an hour, and in Great Britain alone, there were already 6,000 miles of track. So railroads became the common way of transporting goods within a country at any rate by the middle of the 19th century. And of course, that only continued so that by the end of the century, they were common and really <coughs> spanned entire continents. Well, I've already mentioned there was a vast movement to city to cities. One way of seeing that is that in 1800, London had a million people, and there were no other cities in Great Britain over 100,000. There were only six between 50 and 100,000. By 1850, London had almost two and a half million people. There were nine cities over 100,000, and 18 cities who were almost at that level. And so the population was flooding into the cities from the 
villages, small towns from the farms, basically. Now, what were things, what were conditions like in the cities? Not great. People worked 12 to 16 hour days. They were subjected to noxious fumes in the factories, high temperatures, dangerous conditions. Two of my own great grandfathers died in industrial accidents. And so it was a very, very dangerous sort of place to be. On the other hand, well, yeah, here's vision of an industrial town. That's the smoke from a steel furnace behind the houses where people were living. And here's an actual photograph of Pittsburgh, my hometown. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, those are the steel mills, and these are the steps that went down from the workers' houses on the hills down to the mills. I live just barely on the other side of the hill. Um, the steps are still there, by the way. It's kind of cool. The mills, sadly, are not. When I was a kid, actually, that's what we did for fun. We would, like, go down to the mills. And it would be very hot in the mills, so they would open the door so you could, like, watch the steel being poured. It was awesome. <laughs> that's, that was like a night on the town. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> there were good things about this, however. A large number of people began for the first time in history, or at least since the Roman Empire, to have discretionary income. Manufacturing vastly increased productivity, it lowered the cost of goods, meaning that people could afford things that before that were available only to the wealthy. There was increased trade because transportation became so much more reliable and more commonplace. People also traveled a great deal more, so that led to significant increases in income and wealth, but it was very unevenly distributed. Uh, in the cities, there was a lot of crowding. Here you see people in London living in other people's backyards. There was sewage and garbage in the streets, a widespread disease. Um, cholera, for example, was commonplace. Uh, it was pretty unpleasant. There was also tremendous income inequality. In 1801, the top 1% controlled 25% of national income in Britain. By 1848, it was 35%. Today, it's about 19% to give you an idea. So inequality was really, by mid-century, a tremendous problem. And that's part of what led to the revolutions of 1848. Where you see the red stars here on the map, those were the locations of revolutions. So in a number of cities throughout Italy, uh, throughout the Austrian Empire, in, well, what today would be Germany, and then was not yet unified, in Paris, in Tipperary, Ireland, in Denmark, um, there was unrest all over Europe, partly as a result of these conditions. And that is part of the background that helps us to understand Marx and his thought. In 1848, the year of the revolutions, he publishes the Communist Manifesto. Now, he begins by saying, a specter is haunting Europe, the specter of communism. Actually, he's making this up. Okay, none of these revolutions had anything to do with communism. Four years before, he was a journalist nobody had ever heard of, and he was writing things in notebooks about philosophy. <laughs> and so the revolutions weren't prompted by communism, but he saw a good advertising campaign when he, when he, he knew a good advertising campaign when he saw one, and so he said, aha, it's really communism that is underlying these revolutions. So he timed it all very, very well. Oh, there he is. <laughs> if any of you know of New Hampshire's old man on the mountain, looks amazingly like Karl Marx. Um, that's actually a statue in Europe. That's not the old man on the mountain, but it looks like that. Anyway, what is Marx's key idea? It is a version of a two-level theory. It's not really exactly the Enlightenment version. It, he gives it a twist. Nevertheless, it starts, his thought starts with a two-level theory. There's a base level, which is materialism. He says we have to start with material reality, economic conditions and use the scientific method. They are the real individuals, he says. Their activity and the material conditions under which they live, both those which they find already existing and those produced by their activity, these premises can be verified in a purely empirical way. So he says, I don't want to start with abstractions. My philosophy starts with real people and the way they really live. I'm going to start with the world as it is. I'm going to start not with grand ideas, but with the facts and with real conditions on the ground. The surface level, well, that's thought. That is really dependent on what's going on at this other level. So conceiving, thinking, the mental intercourse of men appear at this stage as the direct efflux of their material behavior. Notice what he's doing. He's saying there's a scientific level. That involves our understanding of people's material behavior, what they're actually doing in the world. And then there's what they're thinking about, the way they conceive of things, the way they think about things, the contents of their thought. All of that is really an effect. It is not a cause. It is something produced by these things going on at the material level. And that includes politics, it includes laws, morality, religion, metaphysics, 
anything like that that is on the level of ideology, the level of thought, is really purely an effect. It doesn't cause anything. It doesn't have any independence. It is purely an effect of the way that people are living their lives in material and ultimately economic terms. So he summarizes all this in a slogan. Life is not determined by consciousness, but consciousness by life. Here, consciousness is standing for thought, this mental level, the surface level, and life is his shorthand for this material level, what's actually going on in the material world. And so it's what's going on in that material world, life, that is controlling consciousness, not the other way around. So that's a way of understanding his version of the two-level theory. Life, the material and economic forces are the base level. Consciousness, the realm of ideas in general, is the surface level. All the causes are ultimately material and economic. Everything that really is doing the explaining of anything is happening at this level. All of that is merely an effect, merely a superstructure, something that doesn't have any independent causal power. Okay. So there's an image of Marx of coins. I really wanted to use that in our videos, but it's copyrighted, so I can only use it in class. Anyway, there are a number of aspects of the superstructure. Religion is the most obvious target. He says famously, religion is the opiate of the masses. But it's not just religion. All norms, all abstractions, ethics, uh, anything that involves the realm of thought is like this. And that has real consequences. Here is the destruction of a church on Red Square in Moscow in 1929. So it's something that has an effect on what you think about certain institutions in society. All right, well, all of that is really just derivative, and the same thing is true of ethics. Engels writes that people consciously or unconsciously derive their ethical ideas from the practical relations on which their class position is based. That introduces one of the key ideas of the Communist Manifesto. The whole history of the world, Marx and Engels say, is a history of class struggle. So ultimately, what we really have to understand at the base level is the class structure of society. He says all moral theories have really been the product in the last analysis of the economic conditions of society obtaining at the time. So, of course, that makes him suspicious. You say something, and he says, well, look, you're just arguing that way because of your class position. In a sense, you don't have to take the argument seriously. You just say, I need to look at the practical, the material reasons for your behavior. So, that's one important component. A second important component <coughs> is what he thinks the essence of a human being is. Men can be distinguished from animals, he says, by consciousness, by religion, or anything else you like. And indeed, it's a classic philosophical question, one raised by Aristotle. Aristotle says a good person is one who fulfills his or her function well. Just as a good eye is one that sees well, and a good knife cuts well, well, a good person fulfills whatever is the function of a human being well. But what is the function of a human being? Aristotle says, well, an eye is different from other things in that it sees. A knife is different from other things in that it's sharp and can cut. What makes us different? He says, what's special about people? Now, what is special about human beings? How do we differ from other animals? We're rational. Ah, we're rational. So that might be part of the answer. We're capable of rationality. Are other animals rational? Well, maybe to some degree, right? I mean, you don't see cats just running their heads into the wall repeatedly. Uh, at least not normally. <laughs> but on the other hand, they aren't capable of mathematics. I've never seen a cat sit down and do a calculus problem. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, whatever that rationality is that cats or other animals are capable of, it seems much less than human rationality. Yeah? We're concerned with the surface level, whereas animals are more concerned with the base. Ah, you might say, okay, we're concerned with that surface level. We actually engage in thinking. We have ideologies. Other kinds of animals don't. Walk up to a raccoon and say, so what's your philosophy of life, raccoon? <laughs> right? You're not going to get an answer. Uh, I think it's not just because you can't understand what he says. Wittgenstein at one point says, if you could talk to a lion, you know, you couldn't understand him. He would just have such a different language. I think this is nonsense, by the way. I think I could perfectly well understand what an animal would have to say. I mean, I know when my cats are saying to me, I'm hungry, or I'm lonely, pet my head, or, you know, <laughs> I'm mad at you, so I'm going to pee on your computer keyboard. <laughs> I know what they're saying to me, I think. But anyway, uh, yeah, there's nevertheless <laughs> a significant difference, you might say, in the ideology that we have and the ideology and the conceptions that an animal seems capable of. Yes? Uh, humans think to progress and develop. 
ah, good, we think to progress and develop. We actually, and that's actually very close to Aristotle's answer. He says, we act according to rational plans. Rationality is part of it, but part of it is planning and acting on the basis of plans. We actually think in terms of progressions of thoughts. We seek to make things better. We try to develop. Uh, and so that makes us different. You don't really, I think, most of the time find animals scheming and plotting and planning and constructing elaborate plans and then carrying them out. But people do that sort of thing. So those are Aristotle's answer, answers, and those are maybe the most common answers throughout the history of philosophy. Well, here's what's special about us. We think. We do things. We plan. We act according to rational plans. That isn't Marx's answer. So what are some other possible answers? Uh, before I get to that, <clears throat> what are some other possible ways of answering this question? What's special about us? Yeah? We can conceive morality. Good. We can conceive of morality. We have moral codes of conduct. Other animals don't seem to really have that. Yes? We have like the curiosity to... Like, there's two sorts of curiosity. The curiosity to kill the cat and curiosity is what helped us improve or like become... Ah, good. Progress. Yeah, curiosity killed the cat. So maybe other <laughs> animals are curious to some degree, but they get in trouble as a result of it. We actually have a curiosity and ability to do something with it. Yeah. We're ambitious. We're ambitious, good. Uh, we can... Some people have control over other people, while other... It doesn't seem like... Um, I feel like we have social stratification. Okay. Ah, okay, we have social strata. Yeah, we have interesting power relations. We're going to talk more about that next time. Um, I guess there are ant communities that are like this and so on, but really uh, in the insect world you find some things like that. You don't really find it much in the rest of the animal kingdom. Um, anyway, there are a number of answers you could give that make us different. We walk upright, we reflect, we speak, we abstract, we theorize, we laugh, we cry, we feel, we pray, we worship. There are lots of different things you might pick on as things that are special about us, that distinguish us from animals. And various thinkers have given answers like this. We'll see some later in the course, in fact, that give some of those alternative answers. But here is Marx's answer. We make, we produce things, okay? Do cats really make things? Trouble. <laughs> Trouble, exactly. Uh, do dogs make things? Well, they might burrow out a you know, little burrow or something, but I, they don't really make or produce much of anything. But human beings are capable of that. We can produce our own food, for example. We can make things. We can produce crafts. We can do things that involve producing technologies, let's say, producing products. We can produce art. We can produce music. Those are things that animals don't seem to be able to do. So Marx says, they themselves begin to distinguish themselves from animals as soon as they begin to produce their means of subsistence. <clears throat> so the very first thing we're likely to start producing is food, our own means of subsistence. Food, shelter, clothing, other things we need to survive. However, we can't do that without the means of production. <laughs> we have to have the means to produce. I can't make something out of nothing. If I say, quick, make a, an item of clothing, you might think, well, but I don't have anything to work with, right? <laughs> I don't have any tools. I don't have anything to make it out of. Ah, yes. We need things to produce things. So we're capable of producing, but we need materials. We need things to work on. We need tools. And so the control of those materials and the control of the tools becomes crucial. So he says, what is critical to us, then, is the control of the means of production. And that leads us to his analysis of the big problem. The class struggle. The whole history of the world has been a class struggle between those who own the means of production, the bourgeoisie, he calls them, and there's the classic image of the bourgeoisie, and then the proletariat, that's his name for the workers, those who lack the means of production themselves and have to work for other people in order to produce things. So here you have the person who owns the means of production, doesn't himself have to labor, but simply relies on the labor of others. Here, whose labor ends up being owned by somebody else because they lack the means to produce things by themselves. So he sees the world as consisting of a struggle between those two classes. Sometimes Marx talks as if those are the only two classes, but that really isn't his official position. Of course, there are farmers, there's clergy, there are professors, there are craftsmen, there are all sorts of other people involved in a society, so it's not as if everyone is one or the other. On the other hand, he sees history as being driven primarily by the interaction between these two classes. 
Everybody else is really just part of the superstructure or part of what he refers to as rural idiocy. <laughs> Growing the food, but otherwise having no effect on anything. Now, if you take a look at the Communist Manifesto and throw it into a word cloud generator, that's what you get. <laughs> so as you can see, the bourgeoisie, class, proletariat, these become the driving forces throughout this document. Those are the key concepts that lead him to an analysis of the problem and then an analysis of its solution. And the key to the solution becomes that property. Here he is following Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau had said about 100 years earlier that the true, founder, the true founder of civil society is the first person to rope off a plot of land, say, this is mine, and find other people fool enough to believe him. Well, Marx thinks that's basically right. What enables the bourgeoisie to control the means of production? What enables them to live off the labor of others? In the end, their control of property. So the bourgeois be become the masters, the proletariat become the slaves, and his analysis is, to solve the problem, you abolish private property. If there is no private property, then there are no owners of the means of production. But that means, by definition, there is no bourgeoisie. And if there is no bourgeoisie, there is no class structure. So that becomes the communist solution. And in fact, you could define communism in terms of that solution, the abolition of private property. Now, what does he mean exactly? Well, he means property that is involved in the means of production. So land, most obviously, but also factories and other kinds of things. He doesn't necessarily mean the shirt on your back. That's a bit of property, but it's not really what he has in mind because it's not itself involved in the means of production. Any bit of property that you can use to produce things, that is really what he's talking about. That is what has to be owned by the state collectively and taken out of private hands. So here is the Marxist program that he outlined. A progressive income tax, the more you earn, the higher the rate you pay. No inheritance, so an absolute 100% estate or death tax. Nationalize all banks, have state ownership of communication, transportation, farms, factories, anything that could be involved in the means of production. He advises the construction of industrial armies so that people can be sent to where they are most needed. And then free <coughs> systems of education so that people can be trained as they will be needed to run communications, transportation, farms, factories, etc. By the way, you might notice that certain aspects of that are now commonplace, like a progressive income tax. Others, well, not so much. Um, so certain aspects of this remain highly controversial, others perhaps less so. There's another component to what he thinks is the real problem. And this really stems from his 1844 Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts, where he talks about the problems of alienation. He says the division of labor in the Industrial Revolution is really what produces a great deal of problem. It separates my goals from the goals of others and from those of society as a whole. If I am a farmer, then I can feel as if the crops I produce are the product of my labor. If I am a craftsman, then I can feel as if the thing I'm building here is something that I produce. Suppose I'm a musician, that I can say, hey, that song, that recording, that performance, whatever it is, was really something I did. But suppose I'm working in a factory. Suppose this is my job. I'm factory worker number 487. And what do I do? I go like that. Again and again. Then there's nothing for me to feel that is the product of my labor. I'm just this tool in a much larger structure what I am doing, my goal here, has nothing I may be even able to explain with, to do with the goal of the overall factory. And so there's an alienation I feel between myself and my labor. He says, my labor is bound to appear as an alien force existing outside of me. And so that's something that leads the worker to become fundamentally unhappy. I feel that my own deed becomes an alien power opposed to me, which enslaves me. <laughs> By the way, and you thought your job sucked. <laughs> well, OK. Yeah, that was my attempt at a joke. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is the problem. We get pigeonholed into something that we can't escape. That becomes the difficulty. He says, it would be so much different in a communist society. There, nobody would have an exclusive sphere of activity. Each could become accomplished in any branch he wishes. Society regulates the general production. But that makes it possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow. To hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, 
just as I have a mind without ever becoming hunter, fisherman, herdsman, or critic. And so here's the vision of a communist society. Hunting in the morning. <laughs> These are from a friend's vacation photographs. But <clears throat> Fishing in the afternoon. He takes good vacations. <laughs> Rearing cattle in the evening. <laughs> Those are such cute cattle. Look at that. <laughs> And then criticizing after dinner. <laughs> so I go. I, th by the way, the word here, criticizing, has always struck me as funny. Um, the philosophy department at my old school, University of Pittsburgh, used to have a softball team. We always lost. And then we'd go to a bar called The Decade and blame each other for the loss. <laughs> this is always what we did. Once we actually won. We got to the bar and nobody knew what to say. We sat there for like 20 minutes and finally somebody said, why is nobody saying anything? Because there's nobody to blame. We actually won. <laughs> it was astounding. Anyway, there's something odd about that image because after all, this has to do with a hunter-gatherer thing. That, that isn't even an industrial production yet. But I'll close with the following thought. Mark Serge's revolution, it does depend on norms, and it states his account of justice. Here it is, from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. Now, that raises certain questions. After all, if you get what you need, no matter what you do, well then, why take risks? Who is going to determine these abilities and needs anyway? There will have to be a group. In Russia, they were known as the nomenclatura. They later will call them the new class, who end up making these decisions. But who are they, and how do they get to do that? If rewards don't have any ability, relation to ability or effort, why develop your abilities? Why produce effort? We've already talked about that a little bit. In that way, it creates some perverse incentives. There is a kind of uniformity you might worry about here. <laughs> but there's something more fundamental, I think. It penalizes making and producing, right? I don't get any reward for making things and producing things. And so actually, what's the point? Doesn't it really contradict what's really essential to humanity? Doesn't it take away something that is the very essence of what I am? If it turns out I'm not encouraged to produce or make, it does me no good at all. Marx's answer is, these are temporary problems. Eventually, human nature changes. The state is transcendent, labor vanishes, and a civil society is transformed into a socialized humanity. The philosophers, he said, have only interpreted the world. The point is to change it, and that means changing human nature itself. That, by the way, is that's famous statement in German. There it is in English. And so society will become like this. <laughs> or this. Oh, that's the end. OK. <laughs> Next time, we'll look at Dostoevsky and Nietzsche for very different analyses of human problems.